I'm delighted to be here today to present some of the lessons from the Gender Asset Gap Project. My name is Cheryl Doss, and I'm in the Department of International Development at the University of Oxford. The Gender Asset Gap Project was initiated in 2009 to demonstrate both the importance and the feasibility of collecting individual level asset ownership data. When we started, whenever we asked questions about individual asset ownership, we were told that it wasn't possible to collect this data in surveys, that the best that could be done was to ask whether or not the household owned these assets, but not whether they were owned by individuals within the household. So what we decided to do was to implement nationally representative surveys in Ecuador and Ghana and a survey representative of the state of Karnataka, India, to demonstrate that it was feasible. We did these in both rural and urban areas. And after extensive um, qualitative work, we employed two instruments. First, a household asset inventory in which we asked one person in the household about every asset owned by anybody within the household across a full range of assets and an individual questionnaire in which we asked the two principal adults, typically a man and a woman, about their own ownership of assets. So I'm gonna talk about five lessons that we learned. The first one is that it's feasible to do this. We demonstrated that across a range of contexts that it's fairly simple to follow the question does anyone within the household own X, whatever asset, with a question simply asking who within the household owns it? So that's the simplest way to do this. We can also do a second way, which is to ask about each asset. So because we had a household asset inventory for each of those assets, we could ask who owns it. There are some challenges that we're still working on. A number of people are working on to try to be able to do this work better. The first one is whether one person can respond for the whole household. So when you simply ask the primary respondent, does anyone own it? Are the answers as good as when you ask each individual person? The answer is primarily not as good. Um, we get different answers when we interview multiple people. Also, to think about how we consider individual and joint ownership. Um, how do we understand both when things are jointly owned and what does that mean for the individuals involved? And third, how do we handle different understandings of ownership across contexts? And this is particularly relevant in the context of thinking about land, um, where what ownership means may vary across contexts. But nonetheless, it's feasible to do this. The second lesson is that it's also important. Assets are typically not owned by the household, but by individuals, one or more of them within the household, and it matters who owns them. One reason is that households dissolve, either through death or divorce, and it matters who has claims to the assets in these circumstances. When the husband dies, does the wife have any claims to the assets that were household assets? And women are particularly vulnerable to household disillusion, in part because women typically are married, younger women are married to older men, um, and women live longer than men. It's also the case that household members do not benefit equally from things that are seen as household assets. They have different rights, rights over them and access to them. And finally, women and men use, acquire, and dispose of assets differently. So if we, even if we want to understand household asset ownership, we need to understand who has acquired them and who's using them and who has the rights to dispose of them. The third lesson is that multiple indicators are needed. I'm going to talk about three of them and show you a little bit of data. The first one is the gender asset gap an incidence measure, which is looking at the proportion of women owners out of all women. What proportion of women own this particular type of asset? And we would calculate the same for men and look at the gender gap. 
The second one is also a gender asset gap where we're looking at the share of owners. So of all the people who own this type of asset, what proportion of those are women? In both of these, we're simply looking at whether the individual is an owner without thinking about how much they own. Third, we also then want to look at the gender wealth gap, which is the share of the asset value owned by women. So looking at the value of the assets owned by women as a share of the value of all assets, whether we want to think about that as all assets or all assets of a particular type. We can first look at this in terms of the principal residence. So this is the dwelling in which the, the household lives. We see that in Karnataka, India, over 40% of men are reported as owning the principal resident, whereas the number is much lower for women, about 16%. So there's a quite large gender gap in the percentage of men and women who own the principal residents, both in Karnataka and in Ghana. In Ecuador, we see the pattern is slightly different and it's slightly higher for women. A few, a slightly higher percentage of women are likely to own the principal residence compared to men. Here we're looking at the gender and wealth gaps for the principal residence. What we see in both Karnataka and Ghana is that the share of both women homeowners and the share of housing wealth owned by women is quite low, 29 um, to 39 percent for the share of homeowners. Um, so we do see gender gaps there. In Ecuador, we see that both the, sh the share of women, the share of homeowners who are women is slightly higher um, than 50 percent, as is the women's share of housing wealth. So a slight, again, a slight gender gap in favor of women in Ecuador. What we see here, it's, it's useful to think about the share of owners and the share of wealth. We didn't see big differences in principal residents, but here, particularly for Ghana, but also actually for all three of them, um, we see a big difference. So in Ghana, we see that 70% of the business owners are women but only 38% of the business wealth is owned by women. So what that tells us, particularly in Ghana, but across all of them, is that where women are business owners, they're much, their businesses are much less valuable than those owned by men. Lesson four, that the form of ownership is also important. I mentioned earlier that ownership may be individual or joint, and that the patterns vary both across location and across assets. So within any of the countries, if we looked across the assets, we see quite different patterns of the form of ownership, um, as well as some pretty significant patterns generally across the three um, countries that we're looking at. One of the important points coming out of our work and other work is that joint ownership doesn't necessarily mean equal. So even if husbands and wives say they own it joint, jointly, they don't report having the same rights over the asset. This is the information on the form of ownership of the principal residence. So earlier, we just counted a man or a woman as being an owner if they were an owner, whether individual or joint. Here we break it out. So we, that we see, for example, in Karnataka, 64% of the principal residences, so the dwellings that they live in, are owned individually by a man. Only 23% by women and 4% jo owned jointly by the principal couple. That's in real contrast to what we see in Ecuador, where 41% are owned jointly by the principal couple. So that explains in part this high level of, of ownership by women is that in so many of the couples, men and women own it jointly. The fifth lesson is that the legal context matters. In particular, the marital property rights laws influence how property rights are shared between spouses. Within marriage, does being married confer upon you 
the rights to assets that are acquired during marriage or before marriage. So in a community of property regime, everything that is owned by either spouse is considered to be jointly owned by all of them. In a partial community of property regime, which is more common um, and is the, what the case is in Ecuador, anything that's acquired after the marriage, after they're married, is jointly owned. People may still bring individual property with them to the marriage or inherit some, but everything that's acquired while they're married is assumed to be legally joint property. The third regime is separate property where marriage confers no property rights and each person continues to own their own property. This typically disadvantages women because they take much more time out of the labor force than men. And when they're in the labor force, they earn less than men on average. And so they have less ability to acquire property themselves. What we see is that Ecuador has a partial community of property regime and both Ghana and India have separate property and that women do benefit from the partial community of property regime in Ecuador and much more, particularly the principal residents are, are understood by the people as being jointly owned. Similarly, inheritance laws also affect women's asset ownership, um, particularly whether sons and daughters both inherit um, property and also what happens when a husband dies, does the, does the widow inherit any of his property? So it's really important to understand both the legal context and the social norms about this, how the laws get played out in practice in order to interpret the data on women's asset ownership. So let me conclude. The As Gender Asset Gap Project demonstrated that it's both feasible and important to collect individual level data on asset ownership. And I've shown you some of the indicators that can be created. It's also really important to note that data that's collected at the individual level can then also be analyzed along a number of other dimensions. So what we're encouraging people to do is when asking who owns, not simply to record whether it's owned by a man or a woman, but to actually record the, the ID number of that person. And so that links back to the household roster so that we have more information on them, so that we know for each owner, not only if it's a man or a woman, but what their marital status is, their ethnicity, their age, um, any other factors that might be important in that particular context. Then with appropriate sampling, it can be used to an analyze issues of intersectionality as well as just simply looking at the gender asset gap but we can break it down in all kinds of other ways. Particularly th important at the moment is thinking about youth and trying to understand what kinds of assets youth acquire or what kind of assets older women who are widows have and have claims to. So again, it's both feasible and important to collect this data and we have much more information about the project, um, both the papers that have been published and some guidelines on ways to collect this data on our on our website.